Good evening. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. My name is Cormac Kinsley, um, and I'm on behalf of the Dublin Festival of History. I'd like to welcome you here this afternoon for this event. I'm really thrilled that Sean O'Driscoll can join us today to talk about his new biography of Rose Dugdale. Um, Sean is the author of, also the author of The Acc Accidental Spy, the best-selling true story of an American trucker who became an FBI spy w within the IRA. His investigative journalism has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and The Irish Times. He previously worked as an immigration and criminal lawyer in New York and now works as a news editor in the Irish Daily Mail. His new book, Heiress, Rebel, Vigilante, Bomber, The Extraordinary Life of Rose Dugdale, has already had uh, great reviews. It's, it's on the Independent said, it would be hard to overstate how good this book is. Ben McIntyre, writing in The Times, wrote that it's fascinating and O'Driscoll's research is impressive. And it is a really astonishing story of an English heiress who devoted her life to the IRA, growing up in a Chelsea townhouse and a Devon estate, presented to the Queen in Buckingham Palace in 1958, and training in Oxford as an academic economist. At 30, she commenced giving away her inheritance to the poor. And then in 1972, one of the deadliest years of the Troubles, she joined the IRA. Joining Sean today on stage is Richard Crowley. He's an Irish journalist and broadcaster. He's formerly Middle East correspondent for RT News and Current Affairs and presented programmes on both radio and television, including Primetime, The News at One, and This Week. Uh, Sean and Richard are going to have a conversation um, for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions from you, and then Sean will be signing books afterwards. So could you please welcome Richard Crowley and Sean O'Driscoll. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Um, I'm going to make Sean do some work early on, and we might go to the audience a little earlier than 40 minutes, depending on how bored we get listening to ourselves or how much coughing is going on in the audience. If there's a lot, we'll, we'll take that as a hint that you want to get in and ask a question or say something. Um, but we have an hour. There's loads of questions. Um, I don't think Sean minds who asks them, as long as we hear some. And I'm anxious to get started with an excerpt from the book that I think it's from the first chapter, but it, it kind of paints the scene because we, we, we hear the cliche of the, the millionaire Marxist and the rich young English woman who got involved, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this particular chapter and, and other aspects of it later in the book explain pretty well, very well, exactly who Rose was and where she was coming from and the background that she came from. And it's too simplistic just to say the poor little rich girl. Just to give you a, an example, this is her, this paragraph leads into the whole section about when she was the young debutante in 1958, being presented to the Queen. Um, and it was the last time I think it happened. Yes. They changed the, the system after that. But I'll let you hear it and we can talk about it and, and, and why Sean put it in and we can come back to your reactions in a while. But. Let's hear it. Very good, yeah. It's only a few paragraphs, but it, it's just to kind of set the scene in Buckingham Palace when Rose Dugdale is presented to Queen Elizabeth as a debutante, as upper-class women were in those days. But 1958 was the last year of presenting. The world was changing, and it was seen as a little, a little bit too much, a little bit too um, classist for Britain. So this is the final year of this, and this is Rose Dugdale being presented to the Queen. Most of the girls are dressed in white, signifying their virginal status for the husband hunting season that lies ahead of them. This is her friend Meg would recall. Uniformed footmen came in to make sure we were not messing about to frighten us, but we were too nervous to do anything. In Rose's hands are two cards. The first reads, to be presented. She hands it to a servant who takes it with a smile. The palace guard, silent and bearing long axes, swing open the door. She enters the ballroom. Miss Rose Dugdale, a guard, announces. She walks with poise learned in finishing school and refined by Madame Vacani to the center of the room. There she turns to face the queen and her consort, Prince Philip. The royal couple sit on thrones inside an Indian shimena. Rose smiles. She throws out her chest, bustles her dress, and with outstretched arms, sinks to the ground and curtsies. The queen smiles and nods. Rose rises. Prince Philip nods. 
she does another swan dive curtsy to him. She is now blessed to begin the season, the year-long list of dinner parties, dances, horse shows and balls that mark her out as an upper-class virgin waiting to be plucked. The Buckingham Palace curtsy is what Jane Mitford in Hans and Rebels calls the specific upper-class version, version of the puberty rite. It is also an acknowledgement that one is not of the highest class, that in order to maximize one's chances of ending up with a suitable husband, a house in the country, and some babies, one is willing to bend to the ground before royalty. Well, we'll get your reaction to that, I think, in a while, but there's something terribly sad and tragic about it, apart from being obscene. Um, and it's not that long ago. What was Rose's own reaction, from what you could gather, to, to having to, to go through that? And effectively, this was a deal that she had done in order that she would be able to go to university, to go to, to Oxford. But what was her sense of it and her feelings about it? Um, by that stage, she was already showing her rebellious streak, and she really, really didn't want to do the debutante season. But there's a very good description from the photographer who was photographing the, the debutantes of, of Rose basically being shuffled in by her mother, uh, feeling very uncomfortable, didn't want to be there. But she'd made a deal with her mother that if I do the debutante season and I have a party and we invite all the Tory MPs and all our upper class friends, then you let me go to Oxford. Um, so that's basically how it happened. And she did go through the season. And, and uh, there was a Tory MP who was dancing with her at her own debutante ball who, who remembers her. They went out onto the balcony, they're looking across London, and, and, and he was saying, it's, it's a lovely night, and she was talking about this is such an obscene waste of money. And, but she said it kind of with a laugh, and he felt at the time he wasn't quite sure where he stood with that remark, but, but that years later, it's obvious to him that she was more serious than he took her that night. He, he thought maybe she was being a little glib, but there was, there was kind of a steal there. You have a, there's a description later in the book, I think, or just slightly after that, of, of her first school, of the sort of junior school, and, um, where she effectively fitted in and was a good little girl, if you like, was popular, yeah. always popular from what I can gather, was well-liked and, and amenable and open to friendships, but she didn't cause any trouble. So when did the, the spark come? When did, when did she discover her, her intellectual spirit, if you like? I think... It was coming anyway as a kind of nebulous, undefined rebellion in late teenage years. But it wasn't really until she reached Oxford that it, it truly expressed itself. But it, it was always in a political way. There wasn't any kind of you know, throwing candeliers out a window or anything for a laugh while drunk. There was none of that. But, but it was, she was always increasingly becoming more and more focused on political rebellion, even within Oxford. And, Made a bit of history while she was in Oxford too by dressing up as a man to get into the, to the Oxford Union Debating Society. She was actually the first, first woman ever uh, in the debating society because she and her friend Jennifer Grove dressed up as, as men and put on men's wigs and men's clothes and were actually uh, among the men in the debating society because to that point women were only allowed as observers upstairs Jennifer Grove wrote a wonderful letter to the te Telegraph saying that we as women are expected to only see the top of men's heads during really important debates with future prime ministers and future barristers and so on. So they, they took that stand. And to me, that was, that was the deciding point on, because she got so much praise and because even, even the Tory tabloids saw her as a bit of a hero, like they, she, they raved about her in the sun and all, all the British papers said, oh, look at these two women and they're sticking it to the men. And it kind of fitted into a general uh, change in society in Britain in, in the early, uh, early 60s. And I think the claim of that of, oh, wow, I, I stood outside the system and I took on the system. And within a few months, they had changed the rules that women were allowed full membership of the debating society. And she got more praise then, and she was photographed in, in the Daily Mail um, lifting champagne with her friends to celebrate it. And there was suddenly this feedback, oh, wow, if, I, if I'm seen as a bit of a rebel, people praise me. And it, then, I, then, I think that seemed to, it seemed to snowball from there. But that ordinary pleading or reasoning was not going to get results, that it had to be yeah. not quite the spectaculars that she was to engineer later in her career. But at that point, it was still an attention-grabbing. It was... Uh, yeah. Something different. 
Exactly. I mean, women have been seeking full membership of the Oxford Union Debating Society uh, since the 1920s or even before, but with the suffragette movement, it became a thing and they were ignored and ignored. And even in Rose's time, some of the letters to the Telegraph, oh my God, like this man wrote in, I, I used to go to Oxford, Oxford and if we, if we let women into the Oxford Union, they'll have their giggling and their perfume among our sacred halls and they'll lower the tone and... and uh, so by winning that one, I think that, that really set her on a course. There was, very quickly, because it, it, it doesn't have a huge bearing, but it's interesting in itself, is the, the Mosley connection in the, in the family. Yeah. Could you explain that? Yeah, her, her mother was married to Oswald Mosley's brother. Oswald Mosley was the leader of the British Union of Fascists. And his brother was sort of fascist, but didn't really didn't really kind of go along with it. I don't feel his heart was in it. <laughs> One of the... <laughs> you need a heart to be a fascist? I don't know. Part, but... Part-time Marxist. <laughs> well, one of the Mosley family said to me that his vice wasn't fascism, it was women. And I think that's true. He, he was definitely a cad. He was far more interested in, in carousing than he was in fascism. Like, I, I looked really hard. I couldn't find any evidence of him dressing up as... Yeah, the black uniform or any of that. Um, Would he have had any contact with, with Rose at any point? Um, yeah, later on, uh, when Rose was very young, she went to see Oswald Mosley speak. But he was kind of disgraced by then post-World War II. Um, and he'd lost those big rallies. Uh, and I did wonder... See, you know, seeing somebody in the family who was a political extremist young... Did that in some way influence her? There's no direct evidence of that, mm. but I just thought it was curious. Sure. Maybe it opened her eyes to politics in a way at a very young age. Let's go back to Oxford and, and her career. What was she studying and what was the, the role of her, her, her primary professor, if you like, Peter Adrian? Yeah, um, she was studying uh, pol uh, politics, philosophy and economics, PPE as it was called. And uh, her economics professor was a woman called Peter Eady. And her friend Jennifer Grove gives a great description of them on their first day waiting for Professor Peter Eady and wondering, oh, I wonder what he looks like. I wonder if he'll be cute. And then in walks this woman. And uh, she, she uh, her mother obviously wanted a boy or her parents wanted a boy. I don't know why. I still don't fully understand why she was called Peter. She came from a, kind of a colonial family in Burma, and uh, the family had moved back to Britain, but she still kept very close ties with Burma. And, and because of that, uh, Peter was absolutely fascinated with the relationship between the developed world and the developing world, and favor especially unfair trade, and how, how the West exploits developing countries for their natural resources. And she was way ahead of her. I mean, that sounds, yeah, we all know that now, but, but in the 1950s, that wasn't really discussed. So this, this would have been end of empire. This was winds exactly. of change. Yes. And this was her trying to make sure that yeah. when they did pull out, that they left something for the, the people of the country exactly, rather yeah. than exactly, take yeah. everything with them. And she, yeah, she was very interested in post-colonial issues uh, at a time when, there, when it wasn't a popular subject. And uh, that got a, a lot of interest in her... Uh, as a professor at, at Oxford, and she every year, every summer, she went she went back to Burma to to write about uh, trade issues. She went to Africa. Um, like I had some of her correspondence with Oxford, showing her uh, renting a bicycle and then going from one village to the next, giving gifts to the local chiefs, so she could interview people in the villages and learn about their their trade, the cocoa trade. She, she had a big big interest in that. Uh, and again, it, it was just how, how people were being exploited by the West for their product. So was she the perfect match then at that stage for, for Rose Dugdale, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I, Ro Rose was absolutely besotted with her. And um, she, she, she kind of had that spirit of rebellion that Rose was looking for in terms of her independence, her ability to just rent a bike and cycle around West Africa interviewing people uh, and then her, her interest in trade issues with the developing world. And uh, bit by bit, Rose became her understudy. And then eventually they were in a relationship together, um, which had to be kept secret. 
What would the consequences Not just be? because it was a same-sex relationship, but also because it was, it was professor-student sure. relationship. So, I mean, you had a double whammy there of, of uh, secrecy. And uh, there had actually, Peter had been in a relationship with another professor who had since been moved on once their relationship had been discovered. So uh, they had to keep it very secret. Um, did Rose see that as, as necessarily as a career, or was it still an academic exercise for her, her interest in the developing world and the post-colonial world? Or did she see a place for herself in it, or was she still looking around, looking for something No, I, I, think she saw, I think she saw her, her place in it, definitely. Um, she became Peter's understudy, and she helped. Peter wrote a very influential book, which was a, an economic atlas of Africa, and Rose was her researcher on it. And, uh, I, and then when Peter Eddy took a sabbatical to go and work with the United Nations in New York, Rose came with her as her researcher. And again, they were uh, researching development issues between the developed and developing world. So she was definitely on a career path towards professorship or NGO world at a time when that world was really just developing. And why didn't she maintain that, do you think? She wrote a letter once where she talked about uh, not wanting to be a dinner party academic or not wanting to be a dinner party socialist. And the further on in the 60s, that divide between what we might call a soft left and a hard left was starting to really show itself. And Marxists were constantly uh, provoking people like that, like, which, where do you stand? And, and then by the early 70s then, you, when, when Rose is really starting to show her colors, you have kind of international urban guerrilla groups, um, Bader Meinhof Group in Germany, uh, Red Brigades in Italy, and you, you, you see this kind of, uh, where do you stand? Are you just a dinner party socialist? Are you an academic? Are you willing to take a stand? Are you willing to join the revolution? So would you say she was frustrated with the, the United Nations? I mean, a lot of people obviously then and now saw it or see it as a, as a talking shop that yeah. The thing goes around and around, but nothing fundamentally changes. Yeah. Was, was she frustrated at that pace of change or what she might yeah. be able to achieve? I, I think so, increasingly. I, I think the, the frustration developed later because when they left New York, she and Peter came back to the uh, Department of Overseas Development in, uh, in London. And so Rose was working for the government with Peter before uh, Peter returned to Oxford. Um, I think... It, Something happened along the way there that Rose decided that she wants to go further than this. And I think that that point was when she moved to Tottenham and she set up a, a claimants union for, for poor people to give them advice and then using her family fortune to give to the poor for you know, clothes, coal, whatever they wanted. Then she met a guy called uh, Wally Heaton. And he was uh, constantly, they, they, they started a relationship and she broke up with Peter. But he was an ex-soldier who had been in Malaysia and had seen the British Army commit terrible atrocity on villagers. And I think he had post-traumatic stress disorder. <coughs> and he was constantly pushing Rose. Like, it's, it's not enough to just talk about these things. It's not enough to give money to the poor here in Tottenham. You need to see the bigger picture of the global scale. And, and she already had the information herself from Peter. But he kind of gave her the radical edge, constantly provoking her, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to step outside of this academic world? Are you going to come with me on the revolution? And, uh, and she did. She did. I mean, herself and Peter, I mean, herself and Molly really went out there. Just as a footnote at this point, how rich were the family? Uh, very wealthy on both sides. Her, her mother grew up in probably the biggest stately home in, in Gloucestershire. Huge, huge house. Um, very old money. And her father was a name at Lloyd's and, and um, an underwriter at Lloyd's. So he had a, a very good income coming in from that. Um, and he, his family were, were old money as well. They, they had uh, served in India and served, taken in <laughs> and served. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so there was a lot of money. And it wasn't towards the end of the research that I really got the full picture on, on Rose's wealth because I finally found... Uh, the documents that showed uh, the trust funds. She, she, was, she had money from her mother's trust fund and from her father's trust fund. And on her mother's side, the, the, the trust fund was called Matson Trust, which was the name of the house that her mother grew up in Gloucestershire. So 
Uh, all in all, on today's money, I think uh, about 1.4, 1.5 million in total. Um, Buy a small house in Dublin kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like, she was clearly aware of all of that. I mean, it's, it's hard to miss the, the 300 acre estate. Like, what yeah. was her sense of that, or at what point was it when she met Wally? Certainly, your description is that she began to, to withdraw from the various funds in order to fund her on the ground activities. But did that cause conflict at home then immediately? Not immediately. I, I, I felt her, her parents were, were quite forgiving of what they saw as their eccentric daughter. And God knows for her mother, there's plenty of eccentrics in her life, you know. Um, but I think, I think when she met Wally, that, that's when it really took a radical edge and a nasty edge. Wally was very nasty to her parents. And he had this absolute belief in fighting the class structure. And if you wavered in that in any way, if you showed any softness towards the upper class, then you would be co-opted. He went so, to dinner. Tell us what happened. Yeah, it was just an absolute disaster. And, and he refused to sit with the family. He demanded that himself and Rose sit with the servants downstairs, which is what they did. And um, so obviously things got off to a very bad start with Wally. And her father urged her time and time again to get rid of Wally, but she wouldn't listen. And, she, did, and did she paint Wally as a consequence of her interest in behavior, or was it, in a sense, the sense of it, like, do you think she brought him home to provoke them, to, to, to piss them off, excuse my language? Um, I, don't think, I don't think she thought that Wally was going to create the scene that he did. I don't think she thought it was going to be that bad. But he forced the issue. You're either with them or you're with me. And so she sided with Wally, and um, they continued on giving away a huge amount of money and taught them to people. I mean, Rose... But at one did, point, did the father have to cooperate with that, though, in, in the release? No, of the they, were, they weren't. They she weren't. had access to it separately, did she? Uh, yeah, um, she, she had access to it, and there was essentially nothing they could do by the time she was over 21. Okay. Um, but they did try urging her to get rid of Wally, but she wouldn't listen. And did she love her parents? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when she later burgled her own family estate. In, in Devon and stole all the family jewellery and paintings and so on to give to the, to the poor and to the IRA. And uh, not that those are two exclusive, mutually exclusive groups, but I'm just saying. And um, so in court, she was facing her father and her father was the, the chief witness against her in the case. And she launches into the speech from the dock saying, um, you know, Daddy, I love you and I'll always love you, but there's just this gulf between us now that can't be bridged until one of us dies, and it's all very dramatic. Like reading, however else you can look at the breaking into your family home and stealing the, the, the jewels, it, it's, it seems vindictive. It has more than just a practical purpose of, of re releasing the family funds, but it, it seems or sounds a bit vindictive. Yeah. It was Wally's idea, and I, again, I think that was Wally just trying to create an absolute gulf between her mm. and her family. And it worked? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, was, you know, um, her relationship with her sister Caroline was finished at that point, and they never had a relationship for the rest of their lives. But her parents did you know, try to keep a relationship. I think they deeply, deeply hoped that they would get their daughter back. It was almost like they felt that she had joined a cult or something, and that over time that they would win her back. Well, it doesn't take you long to give away money, even a lot of money. Um, and you don't always see a result, even in the individual cases, but you certainly don't see a result over the, the vast landscape that was Britain at the time. Was there any other structure or plan in place for what she was doing at that point? And can we describe it as political action, or was it simply throwing money at the problem? Um, initially, it was kind of emergency funds for people. And some of the volunteers in Rose's office in Tottenham talk about there was, there was a middle-aged couple who were living in, in a, a cemetery, a homeless couple, and she just moved out of her apartment and she gave them her own apartment. There was, there was a family, one of the volunteers said she was completely shocked to see this family burning up their own furniture, breaking their furniture apart and burning it to keep warm for the winter, and Rose got them coal and so on. And once word got out about her, there was just a line of people coming to the office looking for funds and so on. But Wally then took it to another level completely. Wally's idea was like, okay, you know, buying coal for old ladies is one thing, but like, what are we doing about the class system in Britain? How are we going to bring the revolution? And he said, well, it's in the late 
1960s, the Troubles have broken up in Northern Ireland, and he, he's like, this is the answer we're looking for. This is going to lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom and the overthrow of the class system in Britain. If we just back the IRA, they're going to destroy uh, the whole British structure in Northern Ireland, and the working class will join with them, and then we'll have the giant peasant revolution that will overthrow the whole class system in Britain. And he must have been one of the few people at that time who believed that. I yeah, mean, yeah. It was kind of off the wall thinking. We see they were mixing in very radical circles. They, they were mixing with an, uh, a group of anarchists in London called the Angry Brigade, who were starting to set off bombs and cause disruption. But Wally told me, which I thought was interesting, that the Angry Brigade actually were a little uh, reluctant to have Wally and Rose because they were considered too radical, because they wanted to start bombing police stations and everything. And I have a line in the book that Wally and Rose were too angry for the Angry Brigade. And I mean, that's, that's saying something, you know. Yeah. That's, so they were on the radical fringe of the radical fringe, you know. And what, what was their next? Because it, it began to get more serious then in terms of scale and ambition. And what, yes. was, what was their next move? What was the, their, their first heist? Uh, the next thing then was to, to link up with the IRA. And so they started traveling over to Northern Ireland and meeting IRA people. Uh, who were initially suspicious of them. Um, Eddie Gallagher, we'll come to him in a minute, but he, he, he said that Joe Cahill, Sean McStephon, and different IRA leaders were a bit reserved towards Rhodes. I mean, this upper-class woman coming along and offering her help that maybe she's a spy, and, and then others were saying, well, obviously, if MI5 are going to send a spy, it's hardly going to be an upper-class <laughs> yeah, yeah. British woman. A bit too obvious. And then the argument on the other side was, yeah, well, of course, that's what they want you to think, that it's too, <laughs> it's too obvious. So there was this kind of back and forth about what is she all about, but yet she was coming up with the cash, you know, to buy weapons. Um, and she was pre prepared to put herself out there. She wasn't oh, absolutely. just sending the postal orders in from Chelsea. Oh, absolutely. She was yeah. getting well, she in the was... car and driving over to Larne. Oh, absolutely, yeah. She, she, uh, Wally had a, a family connection through a guy called Ginger Mann, uh, um, in-law of his, who, who was a Manchester criminal. So through the Manchester criminal underworld, they were buying up weapons, and then they would put them in Rose's car and drive over to Northern Ireland. And she had a nice Lotus at the time, and they would stuff it with weapons under the seats and give those to the IRA. Um, so things started to escalate from there pretty quickly. And then, of course, there was the burglary of her own house, which uh, made her a kind of a, a national figure in Britain then, because it was all over the papers, especially this extraordinary confrontation between herself and her father in court, where she's like, Daddy, I'll always love you, but there's no turning back. That, all the tabloids loved that story, and you know that's when she became prominent, I think. But she was fortunate in that the judge looked at, at Wally as the primary instigator, the controlling influence, and her as the influenced. Yes. And that was reflected in the sentencing. It was, yeah. She got a suspended sentence, and Wally was jailed. Um, so she comes outside court and says, oh, this is an example of class discrimination in Britain, because I wasn't jailed, whereas my boyfriend was, and he's working class, and I'm upper class, so therefore the system is wrong. Um, and, and then um, she went back to giving out money in Tottenham and, and Wally went to prison. And, um, Did she maintain contact with Wally or what was the level of contact with Wally? No, well, when, when he, he went to prison and because they were smuggling weapons for, for the IRA, he was put in with Category A IRA people, like very, very serious IRA bombers who were in London. Um, so there was very tight security in the prison, but she went to visit him. And Wally told me that when the prison guards weren't looking, she leaned over to Wally and said, I am going to avenge this for you, I promise. And he said that was the last thing she ever said to him for more than 40 years. Why? Well, she met Eddie Gallagher then. And, then. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of Wally. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think maybe she was also reflecting on her relationship with Wally. You know, that... that uh, Wally was all in favour of funding the working class, but he was first in line, you know. Well, I was going to say there was, a, there was a description where he got the 10 grand, bought himself a new Mercedes and a new suit. Yeah, he did, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, he, he was always very well... This is uh, trickle-down economics, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and he broke up with his wife over Rose, but he made sure that he, his wife got well paid off by Rose. Like she, she, she gave a lump sum to his wife as well, so he made sure that, that, that his family were very well looked after from Rose. And, and Rose told me that, that, on reflection, she felt used by, by Wally. He disputes that, but he, she feels that, that he, sure. he used her. Okay. How did she meet Eddie Gallagher? 
um, to the Tottenham Claimants Union again. Um, Eddie had come over to work in London. He was a, a tunneler by profession, and there was work outside London as a tunneler, and the, the troubles had started. And he was interested in radical politics anyway. There was, he, he used to go to those big uh, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. And he, uh, when he wasn't tunneling at the weekend, he would go down to see Speaker's Corner, and he would see, he was just very interested in politics. So he heard about the, uh, Rose through kind of the radical networks and he went to see her at the office. And, uh, and then he started uh, helping out squatters with her. Uh, families would come down. He remembers very distinctly this, this family from Scotland, and he says that this is kind of a life lesson for him. There was a Scottish family, and they had come down to London, and they had nowhere to stay. So they knew where there was an excellent squat that was divided into kind of two apartments within the same house. So they put the Scottish family in there. Rose is delighted. Then they have another homeless family the next week. They take them, and they're going to put them in the, the flat above them. The Scottish family bar them at the door, and they're, what are you doing? They go, we're putting another family upstairs. No, go away. This is our house now. Slam the door. <laughs> and he said that, that to him was the difference between him and Rose. He sees the individual. He sees his personal avarice and greed and all the maliciousness. But Rose never saw that. She saw everything in terms of class. And uh, he just felt that was, that was a point of difference between them. Yeah. And was, was, it Eddie's, was Eddie's ambition limited to Northern Ireland or to the Irish question, or had he a, the world revolution idea too? Did he follow no, that, not as, that, that? Not direction? as distinctly as Wally. He, he went to the anti-Vietnam War protests, and, but he told me that like, he, he didn't understand what was going on in Europe at the time. He didn't, because he's from Donegal, he, he definitely saw things in a, in a, in a kind of Donegal perspective. Like he, he said to me he didn't understand all this Badermeinhof stuff in Germany or the Red Brigades or any of that, and he wasn't particularly interested, whereas Wally and, and Rose very much were. Sure. He saw things as, we're going to get the Brits out of Northern Ireland. But he saw the value or the argument for direct action. Oh, absolutely. Very much. And he, yeah, he, he joined the, the IRA um, after he witnessed the shooting of a, a co-worker from South Armagh when they were doing uh, work up in Belfast. And um, he said, you know, joining it was very formal in those days. He said it was kind of like joining the Hells Angels. Like he felt it was kind of like you were this ritual you had to go through and stuff. And so then he was in the IRA and uh, Rose was impressed by that, I think. You know? And what was their first job together? Uh, to, because the British had all the air supremacy in Northern Ireland, the idea was what if we could uh, bomb the British from the air ourselves. So that ended up with them hijacking a helicopter and bombing Straban police and army barracks from above with these bombs that were in milk churns. And Eddie, Eddie's description was that, unfortunately for them, the pilot was XREF, an extremely cool customer. And Eddie kind of had an admiration for this guy. Like he, they had a gun to his head and they had said, Rose had pretended to be a British photojournalist and that they were going out to the islands of Donegal to photograph the islands for the Guardian. But then when they were on the helicopter, they put a gun, Eddie put a gun to his head and said, we're going to Strapan and gave them directions how to get there. And then they dropped these bombs down on top of the, the, the station. But he said that they, they lit the fuse on them and the, the pilot deliberately went in over, over the barracks as fast as he could, so that by the time the fuse was about to blow up, they were over Straban town center. So they had to drop the bomb into the river in the center of the town, with like everybody in Straban looking at them, turn around again, come back again. By this time, the British are ready, ready for them, you know, and the bullets are flying up at them. And they dropped one down uh, on the top of the police station, but it just bounced off the top, and the, um, the blast went off, but it didn't ignite the rest of the bomb, and um, it dropped dropped to the ground, and then they said to the pilot, he's, the pilot said to them, where do you want to go now? And they said, uh, the Free State. And they basically had no getaway plan except there was the no pl There was no part B to the plan. Right. I mean, it was a spectacular in terms of attracting attention, and, and had it succeeded, mm. who knows? But in terms of part two of the plan, there was none. Just drop us off anywhere in the Free State? Yeah, exactly, yeah. But they, he dropped them off in, uh, in Donegal, where they... They 
had started pretty close to there and then they hijacked a the car, made their getaway. And, uh, and then there was wanted posters for Rose all over Northern Ireland because they, they could link her to it pretty quickly from the description of the pilot. Uh, her fingerprints were in one of the, the guest room where they were staying. Um, all sorts of different reasons. And uh, so there was wanted posters for her all, plastered all over Northern Ireland. And was Eddie identified at that stage as well, as, or was he still an unknown? He, he was kind of unknown at that point. Like, there wasn't any wanted posters out for Eddie. I don't think they were absolutely sure uh, okay. that he was involved, but they were absolutely sure that Rose was involved. Okay. Um, so and then, then, there was the, then there was the question which worked to their favour of where the crimes were committed on which side of the border, which jurisdiction were they wanted in, and who yes. was chasing them, and could they be extradited, and the answer being no. No, they couldn't. In fact, um, Eddie told me he set off a bomb um, in uh, Harmonstown, just north of the border from a small village in Donegal. One side of the village is in, in the Republic, and one is in Northern Ireland. And uh, the bomb went off, destroyed a garage from a, a UDM man's garage, but because some houses in the south of the border were damaged by the blast, he was charged south of the border with damaging those houses, which was an extremely minor offence and with IRA membership, convicted and got three months in prison, which was absolutely minuscule. Um, so as long as they stayed south of the border, they were pretty safe. Like they could never be charged with crimes north of the border, as long as they were seen as political. That was the rule at the time. So um, they stayed south of the border and decided to start um, committing crimes south of the border until they could kind of establish themselves. So whose idea was Rusborough House? Uh, Eddie claims responsibility for that one. I'd say it was a joint effort. Uh, he, sa he said that, he said he, he came up with it through looking at um, kind of glossy magazines, you know, Country Life and those kind of magazines. And he said the Bates were always in those kind of magazines and showing their house and showing their paintings and so on. And then when, when he went into the uh, National Gallery where the Bates would go down to South Africa for the winter and then they would come back for the summer. So for the winter, their paintings were in the National Gallery and then they would be moved back up to their giant mansion in Wicklow for the summer. So during the winter then, he, he saw the paintings and Rose saw the paintings and then they decided to go for the Bates because Rose in particular was interested in the South African aspect because of apartheid in South Africa the debates were part of the system. They had made their money through um, uh, Sir Alfred Bates' uncle had made an absolute fortune from the diamond and gold industry in, in South Africa instead of buying up uh, paintings, old masters, that kind of thing. And he, they inherited his excellent art collection and they continued on. So Rose wanted to make a point about South Africa by going for the Bates. How much was the collection worth, roughly? Um, well, the, the, the theft was the biggest art theft in the world. And people say that it's still the biggest art theft in the world, but certainly over 100 million in today's money for uh, uh, what? what they stole, not to mention what they left behind. And what was the plan? What were they going to do with them? Um, steal the bit art collection in Wicklow and then hold it until there was four IRA prisoners in London and they wanted them transferred to Belfast. And it's been exaggerated since they wanted them released. They didn't. They just wanted them transferred to Belfast so their families could visit them and it would be an easier regime than what category A that they were in in London at the time, including the, the Price sister, Dolores sister, Del Dolores Price and Marion Price. And Jerry Kelly. Jerry Kelly, of course, yeah. yeah. And um, the, the, so it was basically the, the old Bailey bombers. She want, they wanted them transferred. And if they didn't get that, they were going to destroy the paintings. They where, said. Where, I was going to say, well, where are they, really? I think, like, when you do these things, you have to make it look like you're going to do it, otherwise you're not going to get what you want. So, Rose studied art. She went to finishing school in France and Germany. She seemed to love art very much. I asked her that, and she said she wouldn't have done it, but she had to make it look like she would have done it. Uh, I don't think would she would have gone ahead with it. No, no, Eddie says that she would have gone ahead with it. I don't think. You, if you burn them, your collateral is gone. I mean, exactly. at the very least, you sell them. Yeah, exactly, Surely. yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to appear like a criminal mastermind <laughs> here, but... <laughs> Next time, uh, Rutherford for the House it's, robbed... Like it's, it's, it's an odd I'm one. Sorry. Again, it sounds like it... Uh, because it ended disastrously, obviously, but mm. um, it seemed like it wasn't thought out. It seemed like, again, a spectacular, but not thought out. Not... No escape yeah. plan, no escape plan, really. 
Yeah, this, no. This notion of her answering the, the door to the house that she had rented with a, a bad wig and a bad French accent. I know, that, that's incomprehensible because if you're going to rob a place, like she went into Rusborough House pretending to be a French tourist whose car had broken down. And then once she was inside the door, herself, Eddie, and two other IRA guys rushed in and put, put a gun to the servants and said, take me upstairs. And then they tied up the baits and tied up all the servants and ransacked the place of all its art. But so Rose is going with this 14-year-old servant around the house going, this one and this one, and still pretending to be French. <laughs> and, and in fact, when um, Lord Bate gave a, a press conference the next day, he said he noticed that this French woman knows her art. He, he, right. And he said that to the press at the time, that whoever she is, she really knew her art. So why, when she escaped and got to a safe house in West Cork, when the guards came calling, did she continue with this French accent? <laughs> Just, it makes no sense. There's, there's a version of it where she answers the door and says, hello, yeah. and the guard says, how are you, Rose? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they established it very quickly. They, they, they had seen her down in the, the harbour with the painting. She, she had a, a big hatchback car with all of these paintings stacked up with a, with a blanket over it, waiting for uh, a boat that never arrived to take the paintings away. And I don't know what makes up happen, but she had to go back with all the paintings and then the guards rushed her and got all the paintings. Some of them were in the back of the car and some of them were in the house, but her ID was in the house. The glasses of one of the servants was in the house. So it was clear it was her. Okay. Um, I've gone on a bit and we're running out of time and I do want to go to the audience for some questions, but just her time in, in jail, um, I, I think significant for a number of reasons. One, because she was the first woman into the jail. She was the first Republican woman prisoner and if effectively had the place to herself for a while. But also the relationship with Eddie, strange as it was, and you might describe it just in terms of their emotional closeness, if we can call it that, or distance, and the fact that she became pregnant or was pregnant in jail and gave birth in jail. Yeah. And that, obviously, with the son, Rory, became a significant factor in her life after that. Yes. But just take us back to in jail, <clears throat> pregnant, about to give birth. Yeah, this is yet another scheme. Um, the idea was between, concocted between herself and Eddie that she would hide her pregnancy until the last minute so that they would be forced to take her to uh, the maternity hospital in Limerick. And then Eddie had somebody in the inside of the maternity hospital. He and some IRA guys would come in with guns and she and the baby could escape with them. Yet another hairbrain scheme. But anyway, um, that, was, that was the idea. But a uh, prison officer told me that there was an emergency meeting in, in the prison that night once they discovered that she was going into labor. Angela Duffin, another uh, Republican prisoner, was like banging on the cell door and saying, we need help, we need help. And they, they, they calculated correctly that if Rose has been hiding until now her pregnancy, then something's up. She's, she's obviously planning something. So they refused to send her to the hospital and they got two midwives and a doctor to come to the hospital and she had Rory then at, in, in, the, in the prison itself. I do want to move on to the whole aspect of, of Rose the bomber, if you like, and her, mm -hmm. her friendship and her relationship with, uh, with Jim Monaghan. And it was the serious end of the business that whatever else you say about these capers and escapades earlier on mm -hmm. and the, the effectiveness or lack of it. But when she was getting into the, the mortar making and the bomb making, this had real results in terms of loss of life and loss of civilian life. Absolutely, yeah. And what, what's interesting there is, is that Eddie had brought her into the IRA and he, he was considered their master of escape and he was very useful to them. But because he kidnapped Tita Harriman to get Rose out of prison, he fell out of favor with the IRA over that because he didn't ask for their permission to do it. And so he, he kind of falls out of favor and then Rose goes right to the center of the IRA because she met Jim Monaghan in 1985 and then he, he was head of their weapon development for the IRA and he had a farm in uh, Ballycroy in County Mayo where he would take Rose and they developed a lot of IRA weapons. He was kind of their mortar expert. Uh, mortar Monaghan, he would be known as Mortar Jim. And then they developed uh, all kinds of weapons for um, shoulder-held missiles which were very effective against REC Land Rovers and British Army Land Rovers. They had this thing they developed called the biscuit launcher, which was 
And the, the biggest problem they had in Belfast when they fired these things was that you, a huge amount of gas comes flying out the back and it tends to send a weapon flying and it can injure somebody. So what, what they did was put two packets of digestive biscuits into the back and digestive biscuits by the name are meant to, to, to um, absorb gas, so they did. So this became the, the biscuit launcher and that was, um, they're very easy to make actually those, those things. <laughs> He'll be available afterwards for a <laughs> tutorial. Um, but they were, to be serious, they were making big bombs and they were making yeah. big bombs and putting them in places where civilians weren't just collateral damage, they were going to die, that was, that was going to happen. Well, they would dispute that now. In fairness now, their missiles were used against military targets in Northern Ireland, no question about that. But later on, the development of explosives that were then used in the big bombs in, in London, the IRA would say they gave warnings and so on. Now, obviously, they would, those Dockland bombings, those financial center bombings, Rose and Jim developed um, a lot of the, the fertilizer, icing sugar mix that were used in those. Um, We're talking a couple of thousand pounds bombs here. Oh yeah, above a thousand pounds, mm. 2,000 pounds in, in, in some cases. And it was perfected and perfected, like it started with the pair of them up in the Iron Mountain in, in Leitrim, looking at different substances to use for the bomb. And they, they would have about 10 substances there. And then they found within that, the one that they were looking for. Then they took that down to Bellicroy and then they perfected and perfected and perfected that until they got the absolute perfect mix that they were looking for. And then that was used in the big, big bombings then. Did you talk to her about that? Did she qualms about that at all? Uh, she, she, well, she saw that and Jim saw that as knowing that the IRA was going to have to come to a negotiated settlement in the end and that it was forcing the hand of the British government um, into peace talks. And no matter what your political perspective, in some way that worked because Sinn Féin were not allowed into talks until there was decommissioning and then there was the London Financial Centre bombings, no matter how, and they were horrific, but they did force the hand of the British Army to get Sinn Féin into talks without decommissioning. Now decommissioning happened along the way, but they were allowed into talks because of that and um, they would see it in those terms, in political terms. Jim often says that that the, their role in the IRA was to take it as far as they could and then hand over to Sinn Féin to carry on with the negotiations. There's, there's a lot of questions about this. and Sure. Let me just bring in the audience at this stage and if you can ask a question or if you want to make a point, make it quickly and ask a question because we're running out of time and I know they want to clear the hall and get the next group in. So we can just go back up the... If you can identify yourself and ask the, the question, Hi, please. How's it going? Um, you mentioned, you mentioned um, that Rose was in, um, in a Class A prisoner in London, and you mentioned Dolores Price. And Dolores Price, she was a, she was a hardcore true believer and was quite critical of anyone, of anyone who's anything less than that. How did, how did Rose fit in with people like that, particularly Dolores Price? Um, well, she adored the Price sisters, I think, more than anybody in the IRA. Um, that's what the, you know, the Rusper heist was all about. And... She stayed in, in, in contact with the Price sisters for a long time after that. And I asked her about the Price sisters and she said she thought that they were fantastic and very committed and she liked them far more than, um, she didn't like Dahi O'Connell, she didn't like Sean McSteofon, she didn't particularly like Rory O'Brodick. I think she saw them as the old male guards telling us what to do. So when she found these kind of young radical females like herself coming up to the ranks, she really kind of uh, gravitated towards them. Same with, uh, Bernadette Devlin, she really liked her very much. Okay, who's next? That actually uh, leads nicely into my question. Uh, I'm not familiar with the timeline of events, but from what you were describing, it sounded like she'd have more in common politically with the official uh, wing of the IRA, or even if she was attracted to militarism, the INLA. Was it more the personal connection then that brought her into the provisionals? Absolutely, and I, I think that was, that was kind of pointed out to her at one point. Uh, herself and Jim set up this magazine uh, for, for prisoners on the inside and for contributors on the outside. And it was considered far too left-wing for Sinn Féin who were post-hunger strikes, Bobby Sands were trying to move politically and develop, and they, they felt that it was just, there was too much Marxist jargon in it. And Danny Morrison wrote to them, wrote this letter into their magazine, you know, it was like, what has this got to do with the average person on the street with all your jargon? And um, She probably would have fitted in better with, with the officials, but I think 
just through Eddie, she happened to be in with the provisionals and thought that she could bring them over to her way of thinking. I think that's what her thinking was. Okay, somebody up here. Um, she was a PPE graduate from Oxford and she was working in overseas development, you said. Was there, could she not have um, acted with change on the inside? Was there, was there ever any thought of her doing that? Because she was obviously had a, a good chance of doing that. She, she did, yeah, and a lot of her generation did do that. They did work from the inside. Even the most radical, like one of the volunteers who was in the claimants union with her, who, who was a real radical, um, kind of rethought her life and became a solicitor and on her website of her, of her law firm said, you know, oh, I've been a Labour voter all my life. And her, her partner who was with her at the time was like, that's nonsense. She wasn't. She was far more radical than that. So there, there was this huge movement of that kind of real, real hard, hard radical left in towards progressive politics, labor politics. And a lot of Rose's friends went with that, uh, but she didn't. I, I, I just, I think because she was upper class, she felt she had too much to prove or something, you know? I often felt that she, she was always trying to prove herself uh, by going more and more radical, even as the radical left itself was softening, you know? Anybody else? Somebody there in the orange. <clears throat> uh, you, you, you've mentioned that you talked to Rose, and I'm just wondering <clears throat> what she's made of your book. Um, she's, she's very frail at the moment, um, so it's, it's actually getting post-COVID. She had COVID. It's getting more difficult for, for her to communicate, but uh, Rory said that she seemed to like it. Um, but maybe some of the descriptions of her family disputes she would have preferred weren't in there. Um, Rory says he likes the book, but he said that some parts of it about himself he finds hard to read because he found it embarrassing, you know. Um, but I'll always be grateful to both of them for being uh, for allowing me to do it. And well, did, Rory in particular did, was did being you have very to operate open. under any terms and conditions imposed no. by Rose or, or anybody. No. I, I thought Jim Monaghan would, would have been all controlling over it, but he, he said, no, you can go along and see her. And the first day I went to see her, Jim was there. And then I said, oh, I'm going down next Tuesday. And he said, okay, go on. And he never, he wasn't there for most of it. And he, he gave me a free hand and he was like, you can do whatever you want. And the same with Rory as well. They never, they never asked to see it or they knew that, you know, I, I, like I, there was various people in Unfoblogged and Sinn Féin who, who had tried to write the story and didn't do it. And they knew I wasn't coming from that perspective and they still respected that. She describes Straban as being one of the great moments of her life, the, the, the attempted bombing of the, the police station. But what about the, the regrets? Did she, has she said that was appalling, I shouldn't have done that? Or was there any, any um, self-reflection and, and regret, do you think? No, I, I, I think she was always happy to take that course. And Rory says that it was inevitable that there's something about her personality that was always going to take her to the, to the radical edge. I, I honestly don't think that she has a regret about, about joining the IRA or, or being involved in radical politics. I, I really don't. But I think that she, she feels that the IRA made mistakes along the way that they shouldn't have made. But uh, she personally wasn't involved in those, well, but that's in, disputed in, then. Well, there is the argument that that's the comfortable position to be in, to be semi-detached, is that you? Sure, should, yeah, yeah. But she wouldn't, be the, she wouldn't be the only one who's like that in Sinn Féin. I mean, but I know people, you know, when I went on Liveline and there was all sorts of people calling in demanding for her to be arrested immediately for this and that, but, you know, the, the soon-to-be uh, finance minister for Northern Ireland was caught red-handed building a, a landmine at the side of the road, that the last culture minister in Northern Ireland was caught red-handed putting a, a bomb into a police station. Like, if you start to unravel all of this, the whole political system in Northern Ireland is going to fall apart pretty quickly. And it's not that it absolutely should not be brushed under the carpet, no. But, the, I mean, the, the, it kind of, there, there is a realisation, even within unionism, that you can't, you know, continuously rehash the whole thing or the political system just isn't going to work. But there is, that, that runs parallel with the argument of, or for, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission instead, so that at least you hear what happened and you, you ask people or invite people up, as they did in South Africa, to say what they did. 
Would she, would, do you yeah. think she'd be prepared to do that? I mean, I know she's, I know she's unwell, but is there... She's so, is, she's is, so is unwell she, now. Is she open about it? Yeah, I, I would say she would be, but she's just so frail at the moment. Mm. But I, I think in the, in the wider picture, I don't know why unionists during the Good Friday Agreement negotiations didn't insist on a South Africa-style peace and reconciliation negotiation before prisoners were released from prison. In other words, as in South Africa, if you want to get out of prison and you want to wipe the slate, you just tell us what happened. But that didn't happen. So they all got out, and then years later, unions are saying, oh, we, we want the truth. But why, why didn't they insist on that? I sure. can never understand that. OK. Um, any other questions? We're, we are almost finished, and we're literally in the last 20 or 30 seconds. Yeah, and, oh yeah, sorry. I, I didn't even sorry. get to concerned parents against drugs. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Or any of that. Wait. This is a whole. I said I didn't even get to questions about the, her work in the inner city and the concerned parents against drugs. She, she was asking, was, no, was no. There, would there be a film sorry. or like? Oh, I don't, I don't know. But oh, yeah. look, he's Sean is the man who'll get the check for a million dollars <laughs> <laughs> oh, based on the book. <laughs> Uh, th th there is interest in a production company who seem very serious about it because up to now there's been various production companies who come forward to do something, but nothing really materialised. But uh, I kind of insisted with them that if they are going to do it, that they would sign up Rory as a consultant, and they have done that, uh, which I'm very happy with because I think his input would be absolutely invaluable, and he's the only one who can really tell the story correctly. And uh, I don't think that, I think that the people involved are very, very good and very serious people. I don't think that they would shy away from uh, the darker side of all of this, and nor should they, you know. And I, I think it will be made. I think it will be made as a series. And there's also interest in a very good uh, documentary maker as well. It seems very interested. So I think there could be a documentary as well. Okay. You know? I'm afraid we have to wrap up. We've, we've run out of time. Um, for being waving at me, but thank you all very much. Thank indeed. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.